star. So I can see um, uh, um, uh, we've got people coming in here. And so let me begin um, uh, by saying good morning and good uh, afternoon to everyone, particularly to our European participants, um, for whom uh, those in Central European time, uh, it's 8 a.m. with you. So having a cup of coffee and hopefully a slice of toast um, as you uh, wake up um, today. Uh, my name's uh, Llewellyn Hughes, and I'm an associate professor at the Australian National University's Crawford School of Public Policy. Um, let me begin, as is customary in Australia, by paying my respects uh, to the Wurundjeri people, um, who are the traditional custodians of the land uh, where I am uh, broadcasting to you from. And also let me pay my respects to the elders of the Wurundjeri people um, past and present. Let me uh, also thank the, uh, the uh, sponsors um, of today or the partners for today's event. That is the SPIPA or Strategic Partnership for the Implementation of the Paris Agreement, uh, which is commissioned by the German uh, Ministry of Environment, Nature, Conservation and Nuclear Energy and also co-funded by the European Union. Let me also um, uh, note that the opinions uh, in this seminar today, and obviously those that we've had previously as well, um, are the responsibility of the speakers and don't necessarily reflect the views of the project partners. Uh, this is the third uh, event in a series of seminars that we uh, have held on really the exciting sectoral developments in the offshore wind industry, um, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. What we've tried to do through these seminars is bring together uh, Australian and Asia Pacific, uh, as well as European uh, expertise to enable information sharing, network building and lesson learning from different markets uh, as, um, as governments and uh, project proponents uh, look uh, to uh, deploy increasing capacity of the offshore wind industry globally. Um, We've had some terrific events so far. Uh, at the first event, we focused on the issue of uh, industry clusters. Um, at that event, uh, we heard from the Directorate General of Energy at the European Commission, from Mathieu Balou, from Mark Itgen, who's the Managing Director of the City of Cuxhaven's um, project there. As you know, it's a, an important industry cluster for the offshore wind sector. Uh, from uh, Elizabeth Alsterheim uh, from Norweb, and Nadia Liebrand, who uh, is helping put together the uh, offshore wind policy for the state of Victoria and here in, uh, in Australia. The, the second event um, expanded a little bit to focus on supply chains, and we looked at supply chain development in the offshore sector, focused on both Europe uh, and Australia. And we heard uh, from Ifan Pineda, um, the Director of Public Affairs from Wind Europe, who gave a terrific presentation um, about supply chain development and opportunities really uh, to take advantage of, um, of the offshore uh, industry. And also from Andy Evans, who's been uh, the chief executive officer of a company called OceanX, who's been a strong early lead proponent for the offshore wind sector here in, uh, in Australia. Now, a recent report uh, from the G uh, to the G20 by Arena has noted that the levelized cost of electricity for offshore wind has fallen markedly over the last decade. And that's as a result of innovation and a result of investment uh, and as a result of, of course, entrepreneurialism. But in addition to that, there's increasing recognition that having appropriate policy settings helps provide certainty to project proponents in the offshore wind sector. And because of that, we thought we would round out um, uh, the uh, seminar series uh, here today by focusing on market developments in Australia, but also in other markets to contextualize what's happening here in Australia in terms of law and regulation in the offshore sector. So it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce our, our speakers uh, today, each of whom will speak for around 15 minutes. Our first speaker is Anton uh, Mingjigao. Um, Anton's a professor of law at the National Tsinghua University's Institute of Law for Science and Technology in Taiwan. Taiwan, of course, being a real lead market for the deployment of offshore wind uh, within the Asia Pacific region. Anton's been working on legal and regulatory aspects of offshore wind and renewable energy more broadly for many years, is very well published in the area and has also um, participated in a lot of uh, international activities around the offshore sector and has really got a lot to say about um, you know, where Taiwan's law and regulations sit and also what needs to happen in order to provide great uncertainty for the, certainty for the industry going forward. That'll be a, a really interesting view because Taiwan is, is a real lead market within the Asia Pacific region. 
Next, we're going to hear um, at, about developments in the Norwegian market, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome Ignacio Her uh, Herrera uh, uh, and Tustegi, and I hope I got that right, uh, Ignacio, I, I, uh, I practice a little, um, who uh, is an associate professor uh, at the Faculty of Law at the University of Bergen, specializing in the regulation of energy markets and new uh, energy technologies. Um, he also leads a research group there on uh, natural resource law, uh, uh, environmental law, and development law, and likewise has been uh, working um, in the offshore wind space um, for a long time. Um, so it's terrific to hear uh, from him. You know, Norway's a very interesting case, of course, because Equinor is one of the leading global developers, actually, for uh, offshore wind. But nevertheless, um, Norway's not necessarily a leading market in offshore wind domestically. So I'm really looking forward to hear about local development, particularly in the context of Europe's increased ambitions within the offshore wind sector. Third, uh, we'll hear from Tina uh, Solomon Hunter, uh, who uh, is uh, here with us uh, in Australia, where she is a professor of uh, energy and resources law at Macquarie University in Sydney, and also directs the Centre for Energy and Natural Resources, Energy and Transformation. Tina's um, a recognised expert uh, internationally on petroleum law and regulation, especially offshore, the Arctic and unconventional petroleum. That really matters here in Australia because a lot of our emerging legal structure actually borrows from uh, the existing uh, legal frameworks which are, are available for um, offshore gas development in particular. Uh, and Tina's got you know, very broad uh, international experience, having worked in, in quite a number of different, um, different countries. She's going to give us her views about the state of Australia's law and regulation and where we need to go from there. Uh, lastly, as part of the uh, partnership with SPEPA, we've been carrying out a little bit of research um, looking at uh, expectations for offshore wind in the Asia Pacific region, specifically expectations around levelized cost of electricity for uh, fixed bottom and floating offshore wind technologies, and also what market participants or experts really think are the most important policy measures that we need to get into place in order to help the industry move forward. So in a short uh, discussion at the end of today's session before we move to Q&A, uh, I'm going to um, present some of those results uh, to you. So to give you a sense of what, you know, a range of participants are thinking about Asia Pacific developments in the offshore sector. So that's what we have um, uh, on, on our plate uh, today. Uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the session and looking forward to uh, all of your um, questions as well. Let me begin uh, by passing the floor to uh, Anton, who will speak uh, for about 15 minutes and will give us an update on Taiwan's uh, legal and regulatory framework for offshore wind. Anton. Okay, good morning and good afternoon, and perhaps to good evening to Professor Hughes. And uh, I'm Anton Minji Gao, and I'm from Taiwan. And uh, today I'm going to share the very important message on the perhaps the investment opportunity to investment in Taiwan offshore wind power sector. And uh, of course, uh, as I'm a, I'm a lawyer, so I'm so I'm going to approach the issue from the legal perspective. And uh, okay. The moment. Okay. And uh, actually, I'm kind of uh, involved in this sector very early since the 2006 70, uh, as the, the how to say, the, the, the beginning of the, of the large expansion of offshore wind power policy in Taiwan. And I attend several public hearings at the, the Congress and the, to, 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 how to say, to urge the important issue of rule of law. And uh, even I, and uh, at that time, as some of you may know, in Germany, uh, just published the, the special act for offshore wind power. And uh, I also try to borrow the German lesson and uh, to, to, how to say, to promote this kind of idea in the parliament hearing. But uh, of course, I'm failed in, I was failed in doing so. And uh, what's the problem of Taiwan's rule of law issue? Actually, I try to summarize at this page. And uh, in Taiwan, we only have a lack of legal basis for this kind of feeding tariff, Renewable Energy Act of 2009 and uh, 2019. And uh, we don't have a legal basis for the tender leading selection scheme or the money spatial planning, and also the capacity allocation in 2018. So as you can see, these two pictures here. And uh, actually these two measures, they, there is a lack of legal basis for that. And uh, actually Taiwan's 
before moving into the detail, I would like to elaborate a little bit on the ABC on Taiwan's administrative law situation. And usually we got primary legislation, that's the statute, statutes passed by the government and by the parliament. And the, the, the executive branch are allowed to adopt this kind of second legislation. And uh, usually the this kind of reauthorization to the third legislations are prohibited in Taiwan. So, but uh, not the case for offshore wind power sector. As you can see here, these are the, the we got the primary legislation and the secondary legislation here. And uh, let's the follow the the norm of the public law. But unfortunately, in the field of offshore wind power, you can see a lot of a lot of legal measures without the legal basis. As you can see here, this is a measure without legal basis. Or some of the major actually they are we are kind of lack of proper authorization. So you can I I I try to identify with with some some marks here. And the most of them actually the most serious problem is most of them are admitted for intern, internal ordinances. That means they are not supposed to have legal effect on the rights and the obligation of the industry. But unfortunately, this kind of underground rule actually increasing very fast after the, the rights allocation set uh, two, three years ago. And uh, so now in Taiwan, actually, the, the most attractive, why Taiwan is offshore wind power market is so attractive because Taiwan got the heights of FIT rate in the world. As you can see here, on the below, all of these are uh, the, the rates in Germany, UK, but you can see this is Taiwan's surprise. So that's why Taiwan's market is so attractive to the rest of the world. And, uh, and in 2018, that's around four years ago, and the latest, I suppose, that's the unprecedented large schedule of demand right allocation in early 2018, and that's 5.8 gigawatt. And we are planning to finish that from by 2025 within eight years. And then you can see, at that time, we only got a megawatt installed at that time. So you can see this kind of move is kind of like this frog here. And, uh, and uh, as you can see here, I think like this, this kind of development pace is the, the biggest in the world. You can never see this kind of situation in, in the pioneer country like Germany or Denmark. And you can see this kind of quite a big jump. And uh, so, and uh, you can see here, UK, if we, Taiwan's plan uh, succeed, then Taiwan will become the third largest offshore wind power country in the world. And uh, if Taiwan is going to realize this kind of dream, and uh, I'm very doubtful. And uh, not to mention another uncertainty is relating to the local content requirements. And uh, this is the list of Taiwan's local content requirement list. And uh, we plan to localize 27 items. And uh, I think the most typical part is here. You can see here, wind turbine. And uh, we are going to localize all of the items within just less than eight years. And uh, that's uh, also quite an uh, ambitious plan. And uh, that's why I always and uh, I think and in, in the past actually I I I wrote a lot of comments on the internet or in the newspaper to criticize Taiwan's lack of rule of law situation and uh, and this is the last piece I I I wrote in 2019 and uh, I I just say that the title just say of Taiwan is uh, the offshore wind power installation in Taiwan are sure to become the largest illegal building in Taiwan's history, because they, most of uh, their license are lack of legal basis. And, uh, and then afterwards, I start to move to evaluate Taiwan's offshore wind power in relation from the academic journal. And uh, my, this, my first draft of this article was completed in October 2019, and it's a final published last year. And, uh, and uh, in, in this article, I did a lot of predictions. And as you can see here, now the first serious problem is 
Now all of the project in Taiwan, they face a serious project delay and the cost of overrun because the lack of su sufficient demonstration experience and the lack of care for site infestation, money spatial planning and the wind resource map, a lot of issues. And uh, the, the second problem is the, the local content requirements may face certain challenges. For example, now Taiwan, is really rely on the South Korea made Jackie foundations to, to make a Taiwan's project on time. And uh, finally, of course, as a lawyer, I always say this kind of situation is all related to the lack of rule of law and uh, this kind of regulatory uncertainty to the developers. As you can see here, a lot of rule just bump out after the, they, the developer receiving the the, the development right. So it's create a lot of regulatory uncertainty. And uh, now Taiwan is moving to the more ambitious phase three project, uh, phase three this year. And we, we plan to allocate the right until 2035. So that's a, another very ambitious plan as well. Particularly now we only adding around 100 megawatt since 2018. And so that's a kind of a very, very ambitious plan again. And the, what's the attractive point in this kind of tendering? This time, actually the feeding, we don't apply the feeding tariff scheme. We just try to apply the avoided cost of the electricity company. So that's, a, that's the, that means the, 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 the tender price is the stuff from the only little point, a little, Around like a ten, uh, how, how, how do they? One US at uh, ten ten cent US dollars, and the uh, and the, the second thing is the the project. There is a cap capacity limit for each project, and uh, not to mention the local content requirement rule. And the, even under such looks not so attractive for conditions, and uh, now the, the tendering capacity is really high. For example, now we only schedule the uh, three gigawatt, but uh, now already flooding eight gigawatt. And, uh, and uh, this kind of planning actually is complained by the former Austin CEO and the president. And uh, he complained that uh, this is the, the tendering price is so low, and uh, the, the, the five megawatt cap is too low, and the uh, LCR local content requirement do is too rigid. But even so, the as you can see here, the project is flooding in Taiwan. And uh, why? What's the reason? Because, because if Taiwan's, how to say, investment security or rule of law is so weak, why there are so many projects flood in Taiwan? As you can see in 2018, we only need the 5.5 gigawatt, but the flood in 10 gigawatt. And uh, this year, we only need 3 gigawatt, but uh, it's a flood in 8 gigawatt. And uh, why? Are you wrong? Maybe Anton is wrong about this. No, because there are certain reasons. I'm going to provide uh, the secret about this. And uh, the first issue is actually uh, that the situation in Taiwan is really strange. For example, we got the highest feeding tariff in the world. So if you are the you were the developer, you are going to receive in such a high rate, you are going to stay in the project for for a long time. But uh, but uh, but the, the problem is in Taiwan, most of the the offshore wind power developer, they just release their shares after the after receiving the right. And uh, for example, even and the one company even release one hundred percent of the shares. And uh, and uh, I'm not, my first issue is. Because they can release their shares, so they always they so most of the company they just release their shares before the project completion, and I I don't think this kind of situation is allowed in other country like in Germany or in Denmark. But that's the the norm become the the daily business in Taiwan now, and uh, so are you going to benefit from the FIT or are they going to benefit? from releasing shares. And uh, now I think uh, in Taiwan, the situation is we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't foresee the completion of the project, but uh, a lot of company developers, they just release their shares. And uh, the second thing is, uh, we are going to have a very low tender price, but uh, why Taiwan is still so attractive 
because for the rest of the world, it's mandatory to sell your renewable with a tender price. But in Taiwan, it's not mandatory. So that means they are going to submit a very low tender price to, to win the bid, maybe zero, but uh, they can still find the, find the local high technology company and uh, to sell the, the electricity to them in a higher price, maybe higher than this kind of 0 0.1 US dollars, uh, US dollars. And uh, the third thing is a lot of people are concerned with the local content requirement rule, but uh, actually no problem at all. No, and uh, no need to worry actually, because you can still enjoy very high bidding tariff without fulfilling the LOCR. Because the Taiwanese government now recently exempt some LOCR duties, and uh, and uh, you that means the for the developer they only have to try their best, but if they failed, they only have to to submit their reasons, and the the, the government will exempt your 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 LOCR duty. So that means you can still enjoy very favorable high rates. And the, so I always I how to joke about this. I I always say that this is kind of WTO comfortable LOCR. And, uh, and uh, you are allowed to use the matter in Korea JK Foundation under Taiwan's LOCR rule. And uh, this is the, the Korea steel maker and, uh, and uh, they try to use the Taiwan is lesson to promote their business. And uh, finally, I would like to, to, to say that if you want to know more about this, because the time limitation, I'm not going to, to tell, tell all the details about the situation in Taiwan, but if you are, uh, if you are very interested, you can read this article. And uh, and uh, let's provide some feedback to today's topic, the single regulatory model emerge. And uh, I think this kind of single regulatory model, that means spatial legislation for offshore wind power. And I think this kind of law actually is very, very, great to fix Taiwan's current situation. And as, as far as I know now, recently Japan and the Pol Poland also adopt this kind of approach. And I really like this kind of approach. And finally, let's start, I would like to give some certain message to our audience or some investors today. And I think Taiwanese situation is uh, very good for the developer and the foreign and Taiwan supply chain and the early shareholders. But the Taiwan, this lesson is provides some bad news for, for certain players. For example, I think all electricity users in Taiwan, they are paying very high FIT for nothing. And uh, in terms of the bank and the insurance company, they can they can face the high risk of project delay and the cost of blood. And finally, I think if you are a shareholder, please join Taiwan earlier and the really, and the sell the share as early as possible. Because you because if you don't do so, you may become the losers in the future. Okay, that's the the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anton. That's uh, terrific, and I'm I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and discussions later. Your point um, about the uh, feed-in tariff and low feed-in tariff uh, rates through the auction system perhaps uh, not being fully reflective because of the possibility uh, for generators to engage in corporate PPAs, for example, um, is a really great point. And as I'll mention in a moment, that's one of the issues which has come under discussion in the Japanese market as well as a result of the very low bid prices that we have just seen uh, in December of, uh, of 2021 in the first round auctions that we've seen uh, in Japan. Terrific. Um, so uh, let's now move to our second uh, presentation, which is from uh, Ignacio. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. I'm going to start sharing here the screen and I hope everybody's able to see it.
And good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good any, everything to everybody. I'm tuning in from very beautiful and sunny Copenhagen, which is unbelievable because I normally live in the rainy city in Europe, probably the rainy city in the world, which is Bergen. Uh, so I'm not used to having something that is shining here next to me. So I hope it doesn't bother too much. And after the great presentation of my good friend Anton, I'm going to be challenged to say, where are we when it comes to offshore wind in Norway? And the answer is, you might be surprised, but not too far away. And I think we're lagging behind. And I think Australia, which is going to be mentioned after, is probably going to leapfrog us a little bit. So let me tell you a little bit of the situation in Norway and where are we now? So what are we up to here in this Scandinavian country? So the first thing in the world is to say that we are one of the best countries to do offshore wind in theory. There is a lot of resources in Northern Europe, we are the country with the most amount of resources. Most of it granted is in deep water. So the floating is where we are supposed to go. But behind Australia, we are second largest place in the world when it comes to capacity. And we have the potential to have a hundred times the amount of hydropower that we have, which powers 92% of all the electricity need in a country that is very intensive when it comes to electricity users. So in principle, we should have an excellent situation when it comes to offshore wind possibilities and future. However, we have seen that this is the situation up to 2020. There was a lot of talk about what to do, but there was actually nothing really set in paper. There were no political clear ambitions on where we were supposed to go. So you see this map and you probably recognize where this is, even if you might not be able to read what the text says, but basically you get the numbers, right? So this is what it was planned in 2019 around the countries. What were they supposed to be doing in offshore wind and Norway by 2030? had zero gigawatts. And the only thing that we have now, it's a pilot project on high wind tampen that it's very far from being one gigawatt is 0 0.088 gigawatt. And I'll talk a little bit about this because it's the combination of offshore wind and oil and gas activity. So electrification of oil and gas platforms, something that it is interesting and is emerging in Norway. And I think it's perhaps a way forward for offshore wind to work. So what has happened after 2020? So after 2020, the Norwegian government said we have open or we will decide to license two areas. And these two areas are in different parts of the country. One of them is this one down here, Sørlige Norsholtu, and it's very close to the Danish border. Uh, surprisingly, even though it's so far away from the border, it's quite uh, good for bottom fix. Whereas this one here that is on the west coast of Norway, it's called Utsila Nur. Utsila Nur, it is located about 130 kilometers away from the city where I live in Bergen, but that is for floating because it's actually quite a high depth of water. This was open in 2020. The government said we would like to receive bids for this. So far, 2022, no bid has been submitted. And the reason for this, and I've said it many times before, is that the law is not there. No one is going to invest because the framework is not existing. So what has happened is after a lot of noise that it was in summer 2020, in summer 2021, the government issued some kind of guidance note. This is not very clear what this is from a legal perspective. Is this hard law? Is it soft law? Is it something in between? And they said, this is going to complement or supplement the work that we have been conducting so far for regulating what we will be doing. And we will apply it to these two areas. This went to submission for discussion and comments. They received more than 90 comments. This is a country that is pretty small. It's only 5 million people, 90 comments. It's a lot of comments. And we don't have this rule in place because people are not very happy with it. And we have had a change of government that has also affected what we were supposed to do. But there were about 10 consortiums already in June 2021 saying we would like to make a bid, but nothing has happened yet. So what we have seen is that there has been a constant change and political back and forth when it comes to offshore wind. And that's where we are at the moment. Two weeks ago, 9th of February, 2022, there was a new conference by a new government, new, relatively new since September, about what is their vision for offshore wind plans. So what they said is, we have had rules since 2010, I'll come back to that, and we will change them. Because the rules are, as I've said many times before, and other of my colleagues at the University of Bergen too, insufficient. So we will change the rules that we have in the law, and we will change what we have in the regulation, 
Plus, we will change the proposal for the soft guidance that we soft law guidance note that we have. That soft law guidance has not been approved, but now it will be reviewed, even though it has not been approved, and there will be uh, a, con a decision making is still going on, and this is still pending. And what the government did is that it clarified all news. So it says we will have two areas that will be open, which are this two here that we had before. So nothing new. And they will say we will open Utsiranur, and this is going to be for floating projects, and we will open also Surlian or Shotu, which is going to be for bottom phase. And what they said is we will do this one divided in two phases. Originally, this was supposed to be three gigawatts. Uh, now they said we're going to split it into 1.5 gigawatts. And what they will do is that they divide it into two, doing a first one test run sometime in 2022 for the auction. I think that's a little bit optimistic. I don't think that it's probably going to be the case, but I hope I'm wrong. And then we start having an auction in perhaps late 2022. So there has been a lot of debate on how to split these areas, how much to build, on whether this is going to be adjudicated to only one project or to several of them. This is still unclear. So let me continue and tell you a little bit more about what is going on. In this press conference in February, the government did say that we would like to follow the idea of doing auctions because we think it's the best way of allocating areas and resources. However, we have never done an auction when it comes to offshore wind in Norway, and then the producers are concerned about this because they think that going for auction is going to have consequences for quality of projects. However, they also said that we want to do an auction and we don't want to give any kind of state aid support. In uh, addition to this, one of the big contentious problems that we have in Norway is who is going to benefit of the electricity that is produced. And I will come back to this with more detail later, but basically the government is saying electricity is only going to be used in Norway because we will have cables only coming to Norway and not what I call hybrid cables. There are cables that go from Norway to another country as well. And another trend that we're seeing now, and this is very recent, is that for the first time in history, we have had high electricity prices in Norway because of the gas situation. And what happened this week and is continuing happening, I'm sure is gonna keep pushing prices of gas and oil up. And what we see now is that offshore wind is seen as a scapegoat to solve the problems of electricity in the country. So what I want to continue talking is a little bit why we have this wall when it comes to offshore wind in Norway. And I think there's a few reasons on why we are struggling to get this ball rolling, even though, as Llewellyn said, we have Equinor, and Equinor is owned 70 percent of it by the Norwegian state and is a big developer of offshore wind around the world. But we have very little activity in Norway. Why is this? So the first culprit is the rules. The rules are not good enough. They're too basic. We have a hub energy logo, which is the basic set of rules on this is a law on offshore energy production that says almost nothing, really. Then we complemented this in 2020 with a regulations, so an administrative decision that creates some more rules, still is very basic and still is quite unclear. That's why we need the guidance note, which still we don't have it. And this one basically says you have to do an application and a license, not very clear how the licensing is going to be done, not very clear how the auction is going to be done. And what they say is we will try to foster an auction system, but sometimes we will also do only quality-based system. And in addition to this, we have started very late. And this is, I think, is something that Tina is going to talk later on about Australia. But we have started very late, more than 10 years after we have had a law. And we will see that we are behind everyone else in the North Sea. So there might be no need of electricity in a little while for Norwegian projects to go on. On top of that, the estimated time that it will take to get you a license and to build a wind farm in this country with the proposed rules is extremely long. It's eight to 10 years if all goes according to plan. So the main question is how can we shorten this? And this is what it's currently being discussed in the guidance note that it's being prepared. How can we do it? Do we do more areas? Do we open more? Do we do more parallel systems? Do we ask the government to do all the environmental impact assessment and then sell it to the developers or so on and so forth? This is still a point that is not being answered. Something else that we have seen is that like in 
the Taiwan and in Japan, there is a keen interest in promoting Norwegian industry participation. Of course, everybody wants to support your own business. But at the same time, Norway is a member of the European Economic Area and also the WTO. This might be tricky. This might impose some kind of limits to this. While you also want to promote in Norwegian industrial participation, we want to make sure that we don't pay too much. So we don't want to give subsidies, but at the same time, we need to give subsidies because a lot of the projects will be floating. And the government is saying that electricity is already too expensive. We see that there's a lot of contradictions when it comes to what is the vision that we want to do in comes to this. Also very important is the kind of tenders that we're looking at. So we are still discussing what kind of tender we will be doing. And as I mentioned already before, when it comes to bottom fix, what we want to do is an energy auction, but we have never done it. It has been very criticized by the industry. I am more positive. I think energy auctions are a good way of allocating resources to a better price. Uh, when it comes to floating, the idea seems to be we want to do purely qualitative assessment and we don't want to do a tender that will give much more flexibility to the state also to support projects if they wanted to do with subsidies, which in Europe we call state aid. Another important issue uh, when it comes to the regulatory framework is the type of projects that we're looking at. And this has been already somehow debated and solved. And the main project that we're looking at is this kind of project. So we will have a wind farm that has a cable that goes into Norway because the current government said, we don't want this. We don't have a cable that is hybrid or we don't have a project that is selling power somewhere else. I think this is going to have an impact in the kind of bits that we will see because Norway typically has relatively low electricity prices compared to anywhere else in Europe, and it might be a missed opportunity. But I'm not a politician, I'm simply a law professor, so I probably don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and last bit that I wanted to mention about this more general part before I go and talk to you about something special about Norway is that there is a lot of discussions when it comes to state support. There's mixed signals on whether there will be support for energy auctions, not likely in the form of a feeding tariff, but if anything, more like a contract for difference. But as I mentioned already before, the government wants to have offshore wind, but it wants to have it as cheap as possible. And it wants to go for bottom fix without subsidies. That's what I understand. And that's what they have meant. But if it's going to be floating, then they will subsidize it. And then the question is, is this realistic? Are we going to get bits that will be able to sell power with the prices. Norway has a particularly high costs, very rough conditions offshore. And if you're gonna do floating, we probably are not there yet to the level of the technology, perhaps to be without subsidies. The last bit, I'm gonna talk about one of the rock bands I like the most. And this is the Scorpions. You might have heard them. They were pretty famous in the 80s and 90s. Apparently the CIA wrote their most famous song, which is called Wind of Change. And I think this is something that we could look in seen happening when it comes to offshore wind. And probably some of you will criticize me and think that I'm greenwashing something. I'm truly, I'm not. I'm just talking about possibilities. And the possibility is this one. We are seeing that in Norway, the highest amount of CO2 emissions, it comes from activity of oil and gas. So basically drilling. We are an oil and gas nation. 55% of the income of Norway comes from oil and gas. Whether we like it or not, that is the reality. And we have a lot of this comes from CO2 emissions that are doing by the oil and gas turbines when they are extracting the petroleum. And Tina is an expert on this and she actually teaches in my university oil and gas to Norwegian students. And this is a problem for Norway because Norway has to decrease and cut the CO2 emissions. And because of that, uh, what we're seeing here is that a possibility for Norway would be to electrify oil and gas activity. This is something that Norway has been doing since 1995, if I'm not mistaken, from land. But we are thinking that, why don't we do something else? Why don't we do this? Why don't we put a wind farm between two oil and gas fields? I don't know why this is doing this, Snöre and Gulfax. And we will have a wind farm that is going to allow us to electrify an oil and gas field. We won't be using any kind of gas to fire up the platform and therefore we will be able to reduce CO2 emissions. So in a nutshell, we're producing green oil and gas, so to speak. 
And what we have seen is that this is an example that is already going on. The Norwegian government authorized the construction of a high, a high wind tampon, which is a first, size, first in the world, medium sized floating offshore wind farm built by Equinor and other partners. And what they want to do is they want to power up this to oil and gas fields. And by powering up with offshore wind, they will be able to cut 33% of the CO2 emissions of the field, which is quite a lot. And they will be able to save quite a lot of money and they will be also able to reduce CO2 emissions and not pay carbon tax. And this is something that I think it could be interesting in the future for Norway, because of course you can reduce CO2 emissions, you will reduce your cost of production of oil and gas, we still need oil and gas in the future, unfortunately. And in a way, this is promoting technology that is gonna be green technology, and we will be able to do some sort of sector coupling when it comes to this. And very importantly, there are at least 87 oil and gas active platforms in Norwegian waters that if we want to continue drilling for oil and gas, which is a political question, we need to do something to do it greener. And in the North Sea alone, there's 184 very large oil and gas platforms. And I'm sure that in Australia, it is the case as well. So this is a market in which it can happen. And one of the reasons why it is a real situation and a possibility for developers is that it is much faster. You simply don't have to follow the regime that would apply to a normal wind farm. You have to apply the regime that follows to oil and gas because the Norwegian government interpreted this application by Equinor to construct this wind farm as a modification of the oil and gas field in Norway. And therefore they got it authorized in six months and not in eight years. Much quicker, much faster, and they also benefit from the oil and gas tax regime. This is what I wanted to say to present you a little bit of views of what's going on in Norway and all the different trends that we have. If there is a common denominator uh, when it comes to other parts of the world is that we're lagging behind and that the law needs to be in place and it has not been in place. And this is probably the reasons why we're not moving forward. Thank you so very much for your time and attention. Looking forward to the discussion and listening to my good colleagues that are gonna speak next. Thanks, Ignacio. And I, I see that there's a question from uh, Siak in there about the cost competitiveness of, I guess, fixed bottom, at least initially given the um, you know, high uh, hydro uh, that feeds into uh, Norway's electricity system, I guess also in terms of competitiveness within Nordpool as well, to the extent um, the electricity is feeding into the, uh, the wholesale market. Um, uh, feel free to answer that um, you know, here or we're gonna get to Q&A about 15 minutes, I think at the end. Um, also for those who are listening, um, uh, feel free, uh, everybody, to um, put questions into the Q&A panel as you listen to our speakers, um, and, uh, and we can um, endeavour to answer those uh, either in written form uh, or by um, addressing them during the Q&A session at the end. And Ignacio, we've done some modelling here um, looking at the potential uh, cost competitiveness of uh, offshore wind in Australia for the purposes of hydrogen, green hydrogen production for uh, for export purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some suggestion that we need to see prices fall, but that it's not beyond the realms of possibility that might be possible in a non-grid connected um, arrangement. So I may ask you about that, um, uh, you know, given that Europe uh, obviously sees hydrogen as a, a real potential option for hard to decarbonize sectors and whether that's an option that, you know, someone like Econor or others within the Norwegian market might be considering uh, as well. It might make sense for them um, uh, to think about that kind of thing, given industrial scale and so on. Really interesting um, uh, uh, presentation. I look forward to the discussion. Uh, let me pass things now uh, to uh, Professor uh, Hunter, who's going to uh, give us a view on uh, Australia's uh, 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 legal and regulatory framework, which has just been put in place, but remains under development as one of the Q&A comments noted. Tina. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And let me just um, put this into presentation mode. Hopefully that works. Everybody can see my screen okay? Yeah, great. Thanks, Llewellyn. Um, so today I'm uh, presenting to you the Australian approach to offshore, offshore wind regulation. And um, unfortunately, the tale of offshore wind is a little bit of a tale of, of woe, um, mainly because onshore wind is also a bit of a tale of woe in Australia. Now, we are trying to change that as we sort of 
hurtle towards the energy transition. But unfortunately in Australia, energy that comes from, from wind turbines has really had a bad rap. So what I plan to do is have a look very briefly about onshore and then look at the offshore regulation, a bit of a history of it, what uh, where we are, what the Act is about. And then I want to sort of pull out some faults about the Act and then really sort of think about, you know, well, what are we going to do from here? So before I um, continue with uh, the presentation, I just want to note that Coming on from what Ignacio pointed out is the fact that if you have a look at um, this area here in Norway, sorry, Norway here, that's the UK, they are actually very similar in terms of wind energy to this area in Australia. And what you'll find is the fact that Australia, um, this area around Victoria, uh, which is the mainland part, and then Tasmania, which is the blobby little island, has got some of the best wind resources in the world. And the reason for that is actually very, very simple. And that is that the Roaring Forties, um, which Australia has uh, is, or is a part of, there's nothing really to break up the wind between South America and Australia, um, knowing that global wind patterns go from west to east, the same reason why it's much quicker to travel from Perth to Sydney as it is from Sydney than it is from Sydney to Perth. I think you know just traversing this distance is a difference of about one and a half hours. So you know you can see that the wind speed and and the wind wind direction is is absolutely crucial for Australia. So we do have the capacity to have very strong and very uh, valuable and and extremely competitive wind resources. The problem is we don't want them or haven't up until now. So as part of our renewable energy targets, 20% uh, by 2020, um, Australia had initially started to move with onshore wind, remembering that hydroelectricity um, from the Snowy Mountain Scheme and from Tasmania's dam system already accounts for between 12 and 13% of our renewable energy. So we really only had to get from 12 to 20%. And that was primarily made up of wind. The problem was, was that the politicians absolutely hated wind. And in fact, Joe Hockey, our treasurer from nine, uh, 19, sorry, 2013, actually got on um, the TV, the morning breakfast show, and said that they were utterly offensive and should be removed. And of course, the problem was any politician driving into Canberra, they come around, sort of drive up into Canberra, go past Lake George, and what do they see? But wind turbines. I personally think they're rather majestic, um, but apparently that's not the view everywhere. So by 2013, when we had the, um, the Conservative Abbott government in, wind onshore was a bit of a no-go. Um, there was no support by federal government to the point where many of us, me included, decided that renewables were never going to get a shot in Australia and actually left. Um, the Chief Legal Counsel of our renewable energy agency called ARENA actually left and went to Qatar where the opportunity was better. And then from there went to the UAE. So that just gives you an idea of how um, backward in terms of the acceptance of wind it was here in Australia. We did have one st state and continue to have one state that is very, very strong in wind, and that's South Australia. Um, and up to 80% of, of their electricity capacity is with wind on certain days. The problem was that in um, 2016, they had something called a black event. Uh, we had a storm, a severe storm that took out one of the major transmission lines. In addition, the connector that connects um, South Australia to the rest of the Australian energy market, the NEM national energy market, um, was down for repair. The uh, then had a whole stack of system trips, and it effectively what happened was the single um, uh, cable going connector going into South Australia tripped, and they lost power. When I say lost power, I mean an area bigger than the size of Norway and probably the UK to put together lost power. So we're talking about a substantial amount of area and a couple of million people. They then tried to get the sort of the, the battery backups online. That didn't happen. Uh, sorry, the diesel backups online. That didn't happen. And effectively, the newspaper was, you know, awash with signs of, you know, this is terrible. It's all about it's all caused by the renewable energy. You know, the wind is to blame, all of this sort of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. But then we had the um, 
bushfires of 2019, 2020. If you can remember back to a time before COVID, um, Australia was actually struggling with bushfires and it was all over the news. Um, and of course, soon to be replaced by, by COVID 2020. But ironically, it has been COVID that has really accelerated the energy transition in Australia. Between that and the bushfires of 2019, 2020, we now have this shift um, in energy sources other than hydrocarbons as we shift toward, towards net zero 2050 and Australia recently um, releasing its plan. It's all about wind and hydrogen and CCUS as well, but, but wind plays a major part. So having that in mind, um, Australia really did decide to get its act together, and you know, pun intended. So putting wind offshore was actually a natural progression given the fact that wind was hated onshore anyway. There'd been a whole series of um, you know, TV exposés and all of this on how you know, damaging wind was for your health. Um, and it was also you know, seen as one of the most visually polluting. And there's a, quite a famous photo, I couldn't quite find it for this, but there's a, a famous photo of a coal mine. And then on the, at the back of the coal mine is all these wind, wind turbines. And the person who captioned it was said, you know, look at those ugly wind turbines, you know, never mind the open cut coal mine. So this is just something that Australia has in their psyche. And, but there was a large move to move, a, a large desire to move offshore. And we had about 12 projects that have really sort of expressed interest. And the three were really big project proponents. And the key one was something called the Star of the South. Um, project, which was uh, the first proposed wind farm. It was about 13 kilometres off the Victorian coast, which is, of course, the windiest area in Australia and one of the windiest in the world. And it was interesting because in 2019, before we had a legal regime, they were granted a licence to undertake resource exploration. And that was to look at things like seabed conditions, winds, currents, tidal flow, all of these sorts of things in the area. Um, but there was no legal regime. So the, the sort of the 10 other projects, including the two giant projects that were wanting to also get uh, going on this, had difficulty in getting their, their license from the Commonwealth. But also um, they just couldn't get any traction. And you see here um, on the right hand side, that giant square yellow area is actually the area of where Star of the South is proposing, uh, which is off the Mornington Peninsula. Um, and so there's a large hope that this will get um, approval and, and, and going. They do, as I said, have a license to sort of investigate. So if we go from, from that idea, we then started to think about, well, we need an act. And of course, 2018 was when we first thought about it. And by 2019, there was a very strong push from project proponents. And that's not unusual. So in 2020, the, the Commonwealth Government committed to the idea of developing this regulatory framework for offshore renewables. Um, and that would be include not just the wind farms, but of course, all these associated infrastructure. And to that end, they actually invited submissions. Um, they, they proceeded to primarily take into account the stakeholder interests. And of course, Australia is a regulatory environment where two things reign. First one is minimal intervention from the state. Um, and if you look at our Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Offshore Act, what you'll see is that there is minimal um, state intervention. What the state is really about is, is setting the law and, and really just you know, letting the project proponents in, and the operators get on with that. And so issues like safety, uh, which um, myself and, and a, a colleague, uh, Eddie Weefer in um, Aberdeen put a submission in was you know, largely disregarded um, this sort of then kept going, burbling along through 2020. I think the government had a bit more important things to worry about, like COVID. Um, but in 2021, in September, a bill called the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill was introduced into the parliament. They then provided for an, a um, parliamentary committee to um, have an a investigation or an, an analysis and assessment. And they had a very short window of comments, 10 days, um, very short. Um, and, and in that time, over 40 different organisations put in um, uh, comment, uh, uh, submissions for comments. 
overwhelmingly uh, there were positive from the industry, negative from everybody else. And, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. But from, from the perspective um, that I come from and, you know, those of us who are working in this area is that it's a bit of a, bit of a, a bad law uh, for a whole range of reasons. So with, with almost no um, uh, objection, the uh, Act passed into law in 2021 in November, uh, becoming known as the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Act, and there's also a, a um, levy act that goes with it. Um, we abbreviate to the EIA. And it's interesting because the, the Minister for Energy, Angus Taylor, had this to say. He said that the goal of the Act is to provide regulatory certainty and an approvals pathway in order to facilitate offshore uh, renewable energy investment, which is worth billions of dollars. And it's really about moving the investment sector forward. Um, and, and that's fair enough. I, you certainly can understand that. So what is the feature of this, this new Act, the um, Energy Electricity Infrastructure Act? Well, first of all, and, and, the, and the government makes no bones about this, it's drafted in a manner very similar to the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas um, Act. I don't know what that S is doing there. Sorry, OPEGSA, uh, Offshore Petroleum Greenhouse Gas Storage, uh, yes, Storage Act. Um, and what that does is it, it, it makes it very clear about granting licenses, about safety, about all of your um, farm in, farm out, all of the, the, the sort of the, the commercial arrangements, things like registering your licenses, making sure that it, it, it's got security, these sorts of things. They also declared four types of licenses, which is kind of a bit odd. Um, so the first thing you can do is you get a feasibility license. So the feasibility license is about, well, can I do it? Is it feasible for me to actually undertake a wind farm, a, 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 a large project? Then, of course, you're granted a commercial license in order to be able to undertake the activity of the generation of electricity and you know, sending it back to shore. But there's a, also something called a research and demonstration license where you research about whether you can do it. So they haven't really explained whether the research and demonstration license is about you get one of them in order to then do the research to see if you need a feasibility license. But if you are doing the research and demonstration, then do you need a feasibility license? They haven't kind of said which one comes where. So that's a bit interesting. Um, and the other thing is, is in order to be able to get a feasibility license, you have to have a project plan, which includes how much you're going to generate, where you're going to put everything, that sort of thing. But the, the whole idea of a feasibility license is to work out where you're going to do that. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. So that's not really, um, you know, that sensible in the way that they've done that. There's also... Um, a whole range of stuff, unlike the APEGSA, about safety um, and the regime for safety. And I will talk about that a little bit in more details in just a moment. And the idea is basically to manage them, protect the infrastructure and have a title administrator. But let's not get too excited just yet because there are a couple of deficiencies. The big one is the fact that Australia's offshore environment is really, really difficult. We have a three nautical mile limit which is the state jurisdiction and then the Commonwealth. And that makes it particularly difficult because you have regulatory gaps and overlaps. Secondly, the environment's not considered. There's no environmental management plan, only a generalized management plan. Um, and there's no real specificity in it. And it sits poorly with our Commonwealth plan under the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So it's not really any true environment act. And then there's safety, which quite frankly is just a dog's breakfast. What it really does is brings together three laws, the Marine Safety Act, the um, Commonwealth Workplace Health and Safety Act, um, and then a third act, which is yet to be um, decided or even implemented, which is about what we don't know, but we know that the um, Commonwealth Work and Safety Act is not good enough. So they're going to make it bespoke, but they won't use the safety case. So that's a, a really interesting. And the regulator is going to be the same as offshore petroleum, which is a bit questionable. And the big issue here is if you're transferring from a boat to a platform and you fall here, which law covers you? The workplace health and safety one that's for the installation 
or the maritime one that covers the boat. I'm not sure which, and I don't think anyone does. The other thing is we don't have any regulations. We don't know what's going to be in it, and they're drafted in a way that they may do them, they not they will. There's a whole question about um, safety, uh, monitoring and work ability, and that's not really best practice, but the big one is about marine spatial planning. We, the concept is completely foreign to us. We have no plans to use it, and it's going to create a lot of problems, I think. And lastly is the issue of native title. So they talk about this idea that, well, uh, native title um, rights can be interfered with if necessary under the Act. But the question is, what is necessary? Um, and that means that basically this vague wording may very well mean that native title rights are extinguished. And of course, if we had marine spatial planning, that would avoid all of that. So our takeaways are this, we have a law, it has legislative teeth, but it leaves a lot to be desired. But at least we can get projects going and grant licenses and start attracting investment while we undertake that regulatory reform and drafting um, of you know, licenses and laws relating to safety. But we're always going to be stuck with the three nautical mile problem. How do we deal with this state commonwealth divide? And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Tina. It's, uh, you know, it's been a terrific series of presentations because it really um, does give, you know, a, a strong sense um, that, uh, you know, project uh, proponents in, in, in many cases are kind of trying to move projects forward when there still remain pretty significant deficiencies in the legal framework under which those projects are being developed. I guess deficiency would be the... Uh, uh, for those who don't speak Australian, um, maybe deficiency would be the uh, the translation of dog's breakfast, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, sorry about that. That was very Aussie, wasn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, great. So, um, so uh, let me um, just uh, uh, share my own slides and just um, um, offer a couple of thoughts, and then we'll move to um, move to. Uh, to Q and A. So, one of the things that we've been doing um, at the ANU uh, is some additional uh, work uh, around um, the offshore sector, in addition to uh, holding these uh, events. And that's taken on uh, a couple of different formats. Um, the first of it, as I mentioned before, um, is some modelling work, which has been looking at the competitiveness of uh, offshore wind, uh, uh, and particularly uh, initially uh, in uh, non grid connected, connected hybrid uh, renewable energy systems which incorporate solar photovoltaics and offshore wind for the purposes of um, hydrogen production potentially for export market. And I know that all sounds very expensive, but one of the things that we've wanted to do was to look at how cheap offshore has to become in order to be able to play in that particular space, recognizing uh, that, that hydrogen you know, is, is recognised by our government, at least, as being a potential uh, large uh, future export market for the, for the country to, um, uh, to Japan, South Korea and, and others. So there's a modelling component. Uh, in addition to that, we've done um, some work in the legal and regulatory space. Um, the, the, uh, particularly um, in the regulatory space, what we've been interested in doing uh, is understanding uh, people's views uh, about what um, what policies we really need uh, across the region in order to support uh, the development of this uh, industry, recognizing it's a useful tool for decarbonization and also has the potential benefit of a lot of local jobs uh, to support um, just energy transition related issues, for example, such as we have uh, in Australia and indeed in other parts of the world. So there are a couple of different ways you can think uh, about, uh, you know, looking at future fr uh, price paths and also policy needs. Um, within uh, the offshore sector. One of those is to go through a modelling exercise, um, as I mentioned uh, a moment ago, looking at the competitiveness of offshore wind, for example, uh, within uh, the a grid connected electricity system. Um, a second way uh, of doing that um, is to do what's called an expert elicitation. And what that does uh, is essentially a survey of experts. That is, rather than try and look at, ask the whole population a series of questions uh, about their expectations for offshore wind, Instead, um, you ask uh, people who are recognised experts within the sector about their views um, about the uh, future pathways for offshore wind. And in this case, we looked at the Asia-Pacific market. We, um, we did this because there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, firstly, there's uncertainty around policy has been, I think, very clearly described uh, here in, the, in Taiwan uh, 
also Australia, and also um, perhaps somewhat surprisingly in the Norwegian case. But we also have uh, uncertainties around price. I've mentioned the Japan market a little earlier. And uh, on December the 24th, the first round of Japan's fixed bottom offshore uh, auctions uh, were held. And they pr provided some very surprising uh, low prices, which you can see here, three auctions. The auction cap was set uh, at 29 yen um, a kilowatt uh, hour, but you can see that the prices came in vastly lower than that. That's really uh, caused a, you know, a great deal of surprise amongst market participants. And I think a lot of different companies are reconsidering their strategies as a result of that. So there are huge uncertainties about future cost pathways and also about what the best policy mechanisms are to help achieve uh, lower uh, cost, but also certainty. So uh, as I mentioned, um, what we've done is, is what's called an expert elicitation of prices and policies for fixed bottom and floating offshore wind within Asia Pacific markets. That is essentially asking experts what their views are um, across firstly, expectations for levelized cost of electricity. And secondly, uh, uh, their, um, uh, their views on which policies are most important to help provide certainty uh, in order to drive down levelized cost of electricity to help make offshore wind more competitive within the Asia Pacific market. Uh, and Geordie, I can see you have a question about which uh, jurisdiction has best practice. And in a way, this is a way of, um, of thinking about um, this, uh, this, uh, particular, um, this particular issue. Uh, so let me move forward um, uh, just quickly and describe um, some uh, of, of, of those results. Essentially, um, we've carried out a self-assessed online survey using a platform called Qualtrics to elicit estimates of levelized cost of electricity for fixed bottom and floating wind projects in Australia and in the Asia Pacific region. And we've also asked people um, to uh, discuss the policies or select, I should say, the policies that they think best support the reduction in levelized cost of electricity, both for fixed uh, bottom and for floating offshore wind uh, moving up forward. Uh, respondents were asked to um, select uh, a series, uh, 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 to answer a series of questions, but also identify their expertise so that they, they could only ask, uh, answer, uh, only answer questions about which they saw themselves to be expert. For example, uh, if you focused on um, floating, then you would get questions about floating and so on and so forth. So um, just to very quickly describe uh, the, the results, uh, some of the results uh, of those, um, those uh, expectations. Uh, firstly, um, if you look at newly installed fixed bottom projects and experts' expectations of levelized cost of electricity for newly installed projects, you can see that the mean expectation for uh, level, the levelized cost of electricity in US dollars per megawatt hour is shown for you here and an expectation that there is a substantial reduction over time, falling, uh, you know, uh, not quite 50%, uh, uh, but nevertheless um, improving uh, the competitiveness of offshore wind across the Asia Pacific region. And what was quite interesting about that is there wasn't a huge deviation across different countries. That is, if respondents were answering from Australia, or they were answering from Vietnam, or they were answering from Taiwan or South Korea, that the range of estimates of um, uh, levelized cost of electricity for fixed bottom projects moving forward was in a pretty narrow band. What that suggests is that um, technology, uh, innovation, falling capital costs, perhaps falling uh, financing costs, uh, you know, amongst uh, respondents, there seemed to be a really dominant factor in helping to reduce the costs of uh, electricity even setting aside the kind of issues around regulatory and legal regimes, which we, um, have, uh, which we have been talking about today. Quite good news, in a sense. Um, secondly, we asked uh, uh, respondents to identify the policies that in their view contributed to reducing the levelized costs uh, of electricity for fixed bottom technologies moving forward. Um, they essentially had a menu and people were asked to select up to three different policies uh, that they uh, thought were most important uh, for um, supporting uh, reducing the levelized cost of electricity uh, moving, uh, moving forward out to 2030. And you can see here that the overwhelming support uh, amongst uh, those who responded focused on the importance of policy targets, either price targets or capacity targets. That is, 
um, you know, which we do see in some markets, but which, for example, we don't yet have in Australia. And obviously the idea here is to provide some certainty around the project pipeline, which, um, you know, will help to uh, provide certainty for, uh, you know, for project proponents who might be you know, invest um, significant amounts of funds uh, in, in particular jurisdictions. The second um, area in which, um, uh, which was identified by respondents, uh, or expert respondents, was um, focused on regulatory streamlining. And what we mean here is really the kind of one-stop shop model, which has been adopted, for example, in the Netherlands, in which you have a, a single agency, um, which is responsible for uh, activities such as marine spatial planning, also potentially technical due diligence uh, around available wind resources, uh, and so on, and, um, and so on and so forth. So some kind of streamlining uh, was recognized as being uh, an important factor uh, in helping to drive down the levelized cost of electricity across uh, fixed bottom uh, projects moving uh, in the near term. And that very much gels, I think, from what we have heard today. That is that while there's quite a lot of capacity being planned, uh, at least at an early stage, although a lot of that hasn't reached final investment decision, that there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty out there. And um, some kind of uh, regulatory streamlining approach offers one solution to being able to um, provide that certainty that's required. Moving forward into the medium term, uh, we also asked uh, people what their views were uh, on um, uh, longer term uh, factors or policies which could help to reduce levelized cost of electricity for fixed bottom. And uh, in this case, uh, as you can see here, regulatory streamlining really fell away and people began to um, uh, you know, present the view that uh, some kind of competitive tendering system uh, might uh, play a useful role in helping drive further costs down. So you can see here that there's a general view that some kind of sequencing of policies might actually be a useful approach with streamlining playing an important role early along with policy targets, uh, but then moving across um, to more use of competitive auctions along with uh, continued use of policy targets moving forward. Uh, if you look at research development and demonstration for fixed bottom, uh, there's not wasn't a huge amount of support for those kinds of ideas. And interestingly, also uh, for feed and tariffs or other kinds of um, demand creation was not identified in the long term as being a requirement for helping to drive down the levelized cost of electricity, rather that competitiveness element playing a much bigger role. So I think there's some quite interesting results here about how policies might and regulations might be sequenced in order to um, help uh, drive down uh, the costs of offshore wind and make it more competitive against other technology uh, options. In terms of uh, floating offshore wind, um, we also uh, asked people to take a view on that. Um, and so let me just talk a little bit about that. I won't focus on this as much because there were fewer people who uh, expressed, um, uh, noted their expertise in this particular area, um, which makes sense when you, when you think about it being uh, at a, a lower level of, of technology readiness. But from what we did uh, learn, uh, interestingly, and as I've heard in other industry forums and so on, there's a lot of expectation that uh, floating uh, offshore wind um, will be able to fall significantly in price over time and moving um, forward towards mid-century that it will become a competitive technology relative to fixed bottom, uh, fixed bottom technologies as well. And I know I've heard opinion, for example, that much more standardization of the floating platforms might be possible, which would enable uh, industry to take advantage of economies of scale. That's something that might be less possible in the case of uh, a fixed bottom, for example, um, and might be a, a, an advantage, even though it's more complex, perhaps, um, in the floating space and also additional costs such as cabling. So, um, you know, there's some view here that, that floating offshore wind in the medium to long term has the opportunity to be uh, competitive with fixed bottom. I know that in our second seminar, uh, Andy Evans and others have said that, you know, floating is really the opportunity for Australia. So. Um, that, uh, you know, to the extent these opinions, uh, you know, are, are useful information for what we're likely to see happen in the Australian market, that's quite heartening um, in terms of the potential competitiveness of, of uh, floating offshore moving forward. Now, uh, in terms uh, of uh, policy options for supporting, supporting uh, floating offshore wind, 
Uh, again, um, a lot of support for policy targets and also for regulatory streamlining in, in, in helping to reduce the levelized cost of electricity for floating. But you can see here that there's uh, a greater uh, a level of support for uh, innovation. Uh, that is our uh, research and development subsidies and grants. And we see these being used in the Asia Pacific region today uh, in order to support uh, new technology uh, platforms that potentially could be implemented uh, in floating. There's a strong industry policy element to that as well. Um, and, and, and secondly, uh, the provision of loans or other kinds of subsidies in order to enable demonstration projects in the floating offshore space. And that makes sense if you, if you think about the, um, the technology readiness level of floating relative to uh, fixed bottom. Uh, after 2030, that is moving forward in time for floating uh, technologies. The other thing that uh, view that was given to us uh, was that competitive auctions um, would then once again come to play uh, an important role in helping to um, drive down costs. So again, we see a kind of sequencing, uh, a view about sequencing in a way, although people weren't explicitly asked about that, in which RD&D uh, in the short term, regulatory streamlining and, and policy targets being important over time, uh, but then um, competitive uh, auctions coming to play a much more significant role in helping to drive down the, uh, the levelized cost of uh, electricity. Now, I want to leave some time um, for, uh, for um, uh, Q&A, and I think the other point I was going to make was uh, very well made by other speakers, so I'm just going to skip a couple of slides. They'll be available for you um, uh, online uh, when we, uh, af after the event. Um, but to talk about the, uh, the implications of those results. Now, this is just one way of thinking about um, what future pathways might look like. There are other ways of doing this. Modeling is a useful way to do it too. But nevertheless, um, if you take information from uh, people who are working in the uh, Asia Pacific market, either in government uh, or in industry, then um, I think we can summarize that there is expectations of falling levelized cost of electricity in the APEC region, both for fixed bottom and for floating. And the expectation actually is that those costs, those, um, the competitiveness of those technologies are going to converge over time. So more rapid falls uh, in floating technologies compared to fixed bottom over time so that we see convergence uh, in the coming decades. Secondly, um, that across these technology types, key policy contributors to lowering levelized cost of electricity were recognized as targets to provide certainty to project proponents that there's going to be a pipeline there. And secondly, uh, the reduction of regulatory risk through uh, some kind of streamlining of uh, approvals and consenting uh, processes. And I think that, as I said, um, you know, you got a lot of that picture today as you heard about these different markets and where they're at. And then lastly, uh, that because floating, um, uh, you know, is still a, a relatively early stage of commercialization, that RD&D programs, that is green industry policy focused on floating offshore, um, continues to be an important instrument that's available to government in order to help drive down those costs. Now, um, uh, secondly, um, the, the second point uh, is about this reg the lack of regulatory streamlining that, we, that we've seen. Um, you know, in the other work that we've done, as you've heard today, there's a lot of difference in the way that uh, offshore regulation has been managed. The degree of reliance on existing uh, legal and regulatory frameworks in the oil and gas sector, differences in the allocation mechanism for leases, be it uh, uh, first come first served, as we see in some cases, or um, auction mechanisms. There are differences in economic incentives. Uh, which are being provided, and there are differences in local content requirements, as we heard from Taiwan. It's really a moving feast, and I follow the Japan market, as I've mentioned before, quite closely, um, and you can really see there that actually there's a big move towards um, centralization and streamlining of the regulatory framework already. So for project proponents, you know, there's really a need to uh, monitor ongoing regulatory reforms within these markets in order to understand what that constellation of risks and opportunities um, opportunities look like. And then lastly, uh, just to finish, uh, as I mentioned, um, there, uh, there's um, some modeling work that we've done to look at uh, an, what an off-grid system uh, powered by offshore wind and solar PV really is a cheap alternative, um, might be able to provide along with storage in terms of low cost for hydrogen production, recognizing hydrogen is an option for hard to decarbonize sectors. Um, these slides are going to go up later, and I just wanted to point the audi audience uh, towards that work 
you can download that and take a look at it and we'd be happy to chat about that offline with folk if they were interested in learning more about that work. Um, let me stop there and um, ask everybody